but free to rotate and orient itself exactly in the direction the plastic is coming from. So in other words, it wouldn't only be more cost effective because that installation to, to put it there is easier, but it would also be more efficient. Now, who would like to see this in action? That's, that's multiple people, that's good. Um, so uh, what you see here is a, uh, is a basin uh, that we filled with water. And uh, what we've done here is we've basically recreated the conditions as you would find them in the ocean. So we have fast current at the surface and a slow current at depth. And actually you can see that right here. We have this stick with the lines attached to it. You can see the lines are taut at the surface. So fast current here, slow current at depth. And uh, now I would like to ask uh, Bruno, one of our best scientists of the team, to, uh, yes, Bruno. <laughs> To, uh, to deploy a, uh, a scale model of one such cleanup system. So we see an anchor here, we see a barrier at the surface, anchor at depth, connected to each other, and you see it starts to drift. But then when we release some, uh, some plastic, let's see what happens. So we see the cleanup system moves, but the plastic moves too, but moves faster than the cleanup system. So you see plastic coming closer to the system, moving faster, hitting the barrier, moving towards the barrier, in the center of the barrier, hitting the barrier, moving towards the center, and uh, you can see you know, it's uh, catching uh, the plastic. So. Interestingly, now that the now that the cleanup system drifts, uh, the survivability of the system has also greatly improved. Now just think, think about for, uh, what, what would happen if, if such a system would get, get hit by a storm, for example. Now originally, when the, when the system was still uh, fixed to the seabed, it, um, it had to withstand all the force of the ocean pushing against it. But now that the cleanup system drifts, we only have to absorb a fraction of that force. Compare it to when you're, when you're outside and you, you, know, you kick a rock, whether that rock flies away or is fixed in the ground, your toes will understand the difference. Now, and, and what's more, actually this, the relationship between the speed of the water and, and the force it exerts on the system, you know, that's, that's not a linear relationship. Um, it's a quadratic one. And that is actually a, a very important notion because that means that if we were to slow down the system just a bit, say by one-fifth of the original speed, the resulting force on the system will not be one-fifth but actually one-twenty-fifth of what it was before. And just to, uh, to illustrate this, I brought along a few uh, mooring lines, as I always do. Um, so what we see here is, uh, is, a, uh, is a mooring line. Let's see if I can lift that. So it's actually pretty heavy. Um, so this is, this is actually the, um, sort of the, the normal type of mooring line you would use to, uh, to actually uh, install a, a fixed cleanup system. So this is what would, would be required to withstand the force on a, uh, on the fixed system and um, all right didn't collapse that's good and now thanks to this reduction in speed we can actually now get away with just using this so so we are very confident that the system will be able to survive anything the ocean can throw at it now and I think you know I think the elegance of this, of this design is that we, that we managed to, to make it even simpler. You know, it's so simple. It's just, it's just one barrier, one anchor, two lines connecting them, and a, uh, a central passive collection point to, to buffer the plastic. That's it. And for me, from, from, an, from an engineering perspective, you know, it's, it's just beautiful. Uh, and because the the ocean currents aren't constantly coming from one direction. 
You want the system to be able to, to move freely and rotate the, the, in the, direct, in the direction the plastic is, is coming from. And to make this possible, for this reason, we have now modified the ocean cleanup from being one massive system into a fleet of many smaller systems. And this is actually very important because that means, uh, because it, not, not just because it will be more efficient, but it will also become easier to fund. Because even though the, the cleanup is now significantly less expensive, it's still likely to cost in the order of several hundred million dollars. And you can imagine that, that raising that amount of capital in one go is pretty hard. So thanks to this, um, thanks to this modularity, instead of requiring the full funding upfront, we can now gradually scale up system by system by system, which of course massively increases the financial viability. And this is how we'll rid the oceans of plastic. So, so, so you can imagine that when we discovered all this, we felt pretty good about ourselves. However, there is actually one more thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because uh, we, we, you know, we, t we talked about how the, the, the cleanup systems drift, but the question was, well, where do they drift towards? Well, <laughs> to, to answer this question, we built uh, this computer model, and what we see here are, are basically 50 white shapes, and each white shape represents one cleanup system, and then all these small black, uh, blue dots, that's, uh, that's plastic. And then when we start to play this, you can see that uh, you know, indeed this uh, these cleanup system moves around, uh, the plastic wiggles around as well, and what you'll notice is that areas start to, um, start to form where there's more plastic, so these, uh, these bluer areas and areas where there's less plastic, so these, uh, these darker areas. And then if you look closely, what you may be able to spot is that what you see is that there where there is a lot of plastic, you also see a lot of cleanup systems. And that is of course because the forces moving the plastic around are the same forces that move these cleanup systems around. So, so in other words, there where, and so the waves, the winds and currents we're talking about, right? So in other words, there where the plastic goes, these cleanup systems automatically drift to as well. And in a way, it's like a, like a plastic magnet. And because of this plastic magnet effect, it now turns out that the concentration of plastic in front of these cleanup systems is actually five to 10 times higher than what they would see if they would just be fixed in a single location. And that is what I meant when I said acting like the plastic. No. And, and actually, the, the, you know, the, the funny thing is that uh, it's all pretty counterintuitive. Because what you would expect is that the, the more you slow down the system, the more plastic you would collect, right? But actually, the opposite is the case. Because the less you slow down, the more you act like the plastic, the more these cleanup systems will gravitate towards those high density zones and therefore catch more plastic. Well, how much more plastic? I hear you thinking. Um, we'll get to that. So what we see here is a, is a map of how the Great Pacific Garbage Patch will look like in 2030 if we don't clean up. Now this is pretty bad, okay? Um, we see that, yeah, in an area the size of California, we already get to yeah, concentrations that are say, three, four times higher than what it is uh, today. And then what would the garbage patch look like if our plan succeeds? 
Well, this is the result. Uh, so many different. And now it turns out that instead of being able to clean up 42% of the patch uh, in just in, in 10 years' time, we can now actually clean up 50% of the patch in just five years' time. Five years. Now, and remember this graph that I showed you uh, at the beginning? Well, of course, we also calculated what's going to happen if our plan succeeds. And uh, let's have a look at the results there. It's pretty incredible. So, well. And the thing is that four years ago, when I founded the Ocean Cleanup, everyone told me that there was no way to clean up what's already out there, and the only thing you could do is avoid making it worse. But to me, that was just such an uninspiring message. You know, don't we all want a future that is better than the present? And now we are able to show with data that we can actually make things better again and we can do this and we must do this and we will do this. So, what's next? Now, um, our promise was to start the cleanup of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch by the end of 2020. But unfortunately, we cannot keep this promise. Well, you, know, you can imagine that with such a, a dramatic change in design, this will also have some repercussions on the planning, right? So instead, we are here to announce that we will be launching our first actual cleanup system to be deployed in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, the one that will start the ocean cleanup within the next 12 months. So as you know, but now at the Ocean Cleanup, we're pretty good at making computer renderings. Um, but, but soon, all of this can actually become reality. And that reality is clear.
closer than you might think. At this very moment, the first parts of, uh, of the system are already in production, including this one, the first element of, uh, of the, the floating pipe of the, of, the, of the barrier, which is being made in, uh, in California right now. But I would say that it is even closer than you might think. Do you get it? <laughs> um, maybe even as close as behind this screen? So that's an anchor, um, and uh, yeah, there's so much more I could share with you today, but uh, I think I'll have to leave that for next time. So, so thank you, and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Before we start our program, I would just like to take a moment of silence for Brussels. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the very first Environmental Media Association and the Nature Conservancy Speakers Series event. You are the first ones in this hopefully long series that we continue to make. I'm excited to be here tonight representing the EMA board and being the moderator of this evening. Um, thanks, Asher. The EMA and TNC speaker series will team up with some of the most important social and environmental NGOs for engaging conversations, panels, and keynotes with the brightest minds from all over the globe. Uh, each of our events will not only be accessible to our audience, but also available to view online on our YouTube page and our brand new Environmental Media Network podcast channel. Okay? Um, as some of you may know, I've been, uh, since I was a teenager, I've been dedicated to coastal and marine issues. Uh, as a member of Gila Bay for, feels like, over 20 years now. Um, as well as EMA, I, I will always be one of the first people to lend my voice to issues affecting our ocean and the coastline. Um, many years ago now, uh, some of our lovely panelists from Five Gyres, uh, we, we met up and started working together to ban the, the plastic ba bags from the supermarkets, which finally got passed. Yay. But hold your, hold your clapping because we're now having major issues with it and it's being threatened and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, <clears throat> but while we were stumping for the plastic bags, the Five Gyres Institute began working on their next challenge, pushing through legislation on another danger facing, facing our oceans, which is microbeads. The subject of tonight's discussion, microbeads versus the environment, the hidden danger. Okay, so what is a microbead? Why is it dangerous? And even though manufacturing microbeads in the United States will be banned in 2017, will that really affect the damage these tiny pieces of plastic are doing to our oceans and coastlines and fish? Let's find out. Here on our panel, we have Dr. Stephanie Weir, 
Lead Marine Scientist for the Nature Conservancy, Asher Levin, Director of Business Development for the Environmental Media Association, Dr. Marcus Erickson and Anna Cummings, co-founders of the Five Gyres Institute. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and a little bit later, we'll be hearing from former Santa Monica Mayor and current State Assembly Member Richard Bloom. So Asher, please come up here. Thank you. All right. Here we go. I don't know if I even need the mic. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, welcome to the first speaker series. We're very excited about this. This was something that uh, we had a conversation. Um, Stephanie's associate, who is not here tonight, Jeff Rochester. Uh, we've been trying to work together on something really fun and really cool for a while and we thought it would be fun to start this process by doing these speaker series events. Uh, we'll be doing a ton of them, uh, hopefully a bunch a year, both in this country and then hopefully everywhere else we will have a celebrity moderator like Amy here and a panel of experts like everyone except for me and uh, we will put it on our networks and everybody will be able to see it and get educated about all things environmental. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, first of all, uh, we have a message from Dan Jacobson, our friend from Environment California, uh, who helped pass the plastic ban bill. As Amy alluded to, um, it is now under the risk of getting repealed. Um, so just a little background, Government, uh, Governor Brown signed SB 270, a law banning single-use plastic bags from grocery stores in 2014. I don't know if you all remember that, but now we have to not use plastic bags, which is a very, very good thing. Uh, interesting side note, the day the bill was signed off on, uh, the out-of-state plastic industry spent over $3 million to stop the law from going into effect on July 1st, 2015, and then placed the referendum on the ballot for November 2016. So, just to recap, the opposition has now pledged to spend between 50 and $55 million to defeat the bag ban that is currently in place, and it's only been in place for about a year now. So we need everybody in this audience to call everybody that they know, put it on Facebook, and really support, support keeping the California bag ban. We all know that everybody here knows how to use their Facebook pages really well for political stuff. Um, so, having said that, uh, one more time, I just want to thank Anna uh, and the Five Gyres team for letting us use this wonderful place for our first event. It is beautiful. Um, we can't thank them enough for this being our inaugural speaker event here, and uh, we're super excited about this topic, which I don't really know very much about. Um, I just know that microbeads are something that is very real, and the minute that I started learning about them, I told my wife that we can no longer use toothpaste the way that she buys them, and I looked to Amazon and started purchasing toothpaste that did not have microbeads anymore, and so now I'm like a Nazi in the house with everything that may have a microbead in it because of everything these people are going to tell you tonight. So, um, I think without further ado, Anna, you wanna come up here? Oh, oh wait, sorry, or Stephanie first, yes. There we go, it's the first time it kicks out. Um, Stephanie is going to uh, talk about the global effects of plastic waste in the ocean and the coastal uh, areas, which uh, is not just about microbeads, it's sort of the runs the gamut. Um, and I think that that is uh, that. Stephanie? Right, I do believe we are starting with a bit of a video. Is that we right? are, yes we are. We have a video about the Nature Conservancy because we are, uh, we are really concerned about you knowing that the Nature Conservancy exists. It is obviously a very small organization that we're trying to put on a platform tonight because Lord knows it needs more funding and attention. Um, so without further ado, uh, here we go. At the Nature Conservancy, our mission is to save the lands and waters that life depends on. We do land-based work, but also marine work, fresh water work, climate policy, advocacy, the whole kit and caboodle. The Nature Conservancy of Hawaii and Alexander and Baldwin recently signed a 7,000 acre preservation agreement. 
people of Patagonia in Argentina are in a constant battle against the elements to make a living. Now they're getting help from a U.S.-based environmental organization. This fire proof in the Nature Conservancy is trying to prevent the next big fire from happening here. The Nature Conservancy served on Governor Cuomo's 2100 Resiliency Commission. The Nature Conservancy played a major role in this summer. The Nature Conservancy is really the best at what they do, and Neutrogena also, this month for every purifying facial cleanser that they sell, they're donating 10% to the Nature Conservancy. The LEAF program stands for Leaders in Environmental Action for the Future, and it's really a partnership between environmental high schools across the country to empower the next generation of green leaders. I'm Macklemore. I'm Ryan Lewis. Look what you do for Earth. I'm going to ask you guys to put your hands up here in a minute. Um, so it's great to be here. My job, and I'm feeling a little Hollywood tonight, I'm from a tiny little coastal town in North Carolina, so I'm a bit overwhelmed, but I thought I would set the scene for you guys and um, give, start with a spoiler, okay? So, and it's a good spoiler, and that is that there's really good news in the story that we're going to be talking about tonight, that we can solve this problem. There are a lot of environmental problems that I face in working at the Nature Conservancy that are overwhelming, um, can leave me depressed and lost, um, not insurmountable, that, but that really require a, 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 quite a lot of what I call MacGyverness, a lot of innovation. This is a problem with solutions in reach, and so that's something that's really exciting. Some of these problems are already, um, or some of these solutions are already being put in play, and we're going to hear a little bit about that from Richard Bloom in a little bit tonight. But um, I want you to keep this in the forefront of your minds because we're gonna also be talking about some things that are a bit disturbing and worrisome, but when you leave, we want you to feel empowered and excited about what you can do to be a part of the solution. So, when I talked about putting your hands up, so how many people, by a show of hands, have stood at the ocean's edge, or maybe on the bow of a boat, and looked out and said, damn, the ocean is huge. It's vast, it's endless, it's infinite, right? Okay, so, Millions of you, and billions probably more, have been looking at the ocean in this very same way. And this has been going on for a millennia, right? And it's a big problem because we have seen the ocean as this limitless space that we can really do anything we want with and really not have much effect on it. But it's become our dumping ground. And what we've learned is that we certainly have done a lot to impact the oceans. There is not a single patch of ocean out there that has not had some sort of human influence. There's no pristine sea, despite what you may hear. People like to float that around, talk about it. We can talk about that over cocktails. It's one of my least favorite words, pristine, because it just doesn't exist anymore and we have to face that fact. But um, you know, that doesn't mean that we can't do something about it. We're learning that we've really suffered from this idea that the ocean is too big to fail. What we're learning now is that there are baby salmon in Puget Sound that are showing up with uh, cocaine, caffeine, pharmaceuticals, petrochemicals in their tissues, and these are just the baby salmon. But this isn't obviously a, a West Coast issue. It's an East Coast issue. New York City discharges 500 gallon, 500 million, sorry, that's hard to get out, million gallons of raw sewage into the Hudson River every week, right under the noses of clueless New Yorkers, and it's mostly because they just assume it's getting taken care of. It's certainly not a U.S. problem. This is a much bigger problem when we go outside into the developing world. In the Caribbean, the sewage that's discharged, that is produced in the Caribbean, 85% of it is discharged raw and untreated into those crystal clear blue waters that we all fantasize about swimming in and going on vacation. This is a problem in the Pacific Islands. The Pacific Islands experience similar issues with, wa with wastewater treatment and discharge. But there are also many places where people don't have a toilet, so they use the ocean as their toilet, and just big travel hint, if you go to a remote Pacific Island, you wanna find out where that beach is so that you don't happen upon it accidentally. I've actually had that happen to friends, fortunately, not myself, but you don't wanna end up swimming in those waters. So this really is a global problem, 
And it's not obviously about the oceans, right? Swimming in sewage, being exposed to organisms or eating things that have been exposed to it can make us sick too. So um, it's something that we need to think about just for planetary health, but also human health. And again, just want to remind you that this is a problem we can solve, and we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of that tonight. Well, good evening, and thank you. A special thank you to Asher for really spearheading this whole event tonight. Yes. sound like a strange thing to say, but I can say it amongst this crowd. It's a really exciting time to be involved in the world of plastic garbage. Um, we've seen this movement come a long way. We've watched the issue of plastic pollution rise from relative obscurity to popularity in a very short period of time. From a nascent issue in my childhood to now a major global movement around the world attracting interest from brands, from activists, from global leaders. Um, and it's really happened in such a short period of time. But what's interesting is that both the science and some of the opposition, the, the battles between industry and grassroots activists, go way far back, um, back to the early 50s and 60s. Uh, it was in the early 50s that plastics first were heavily marketed in a big way to consumers. Some of the ads like this, this is a real ad from DuPont, um, from Gets Better, from Life magazine back in 1955. Good things are twice as nice in cellophane. Three times as good. So these early ads really epitomized our, our thinking then about plastic. Plastic was an amazing material. It's cheap, it's durable, um, incredibly versatile, and it was designed for easy disposability. But now some 50 or 60 years later, we see the mark of this disposable design around the world, and it's left a very ugly mark. Um, also dating back to the 50s and 60s, we saw some of the first anti-litter campaigns cropping up. Ads like the famous Crying Indian, this was a campaign funded by industry to promote the idea that it's people that are responsible for litter, not the manufacturers, not the, the producers of these, of these products. The science also goes back to the 70s, even though it's really been recent on the, on the public arena. As early as 1972, the first uh, major study on plastic pollution by Ed Carpenter warned back then that increasing production of plastic pol pollution, uh, of plastic products, would undoubtedly lead to the increased con concentration of these particles, and how, how prophetic those words were. And in 1984, a New York Times article warned of a toxic tide of plastic threatening aquatic species around the world, and that conservationists were lobbying for federal and local legislation. But there really wasn't a strong movement until this man came around. This is Captain Charles Moore, who first brought the, uh, the issue of plastic pollution in the North Pacific gyre to the public's attention. And I, I do want to just give a quick round of applause to Charlie. <laughs> Those of you who know me know that meeting Charlie uh, influenced my life in many profound ways, um, both inspired my career path, but also Charlie introduced me to his director of research and education, who then proposed to me in the middle of the North Pacific gyre, and that is Dr. Marcus Harrison. <laughs> Charlie's work to really popularize this issue, um, some of the, the social media um, images have become increasingly more popular and have really galvanized public's interest. And Charlie was even able to get this issue um, on CNN, on Oprah, which has got to be the pinnacle of, of, of a movement, getting on the Oprah show. <laughs> and images like this, which really move the public. Um, and I do want to share a quick word about Mae West. We did bring Mae West back to Hollywood. She's safely living in Culver City, if anyone's interested in seeing her. Um, it was really thanks to so many organizations, though, around the world um, to, to bring this issue to the forefront. Marcus and I realized in 2008 and 2009 that there was a lot of focus on the North Pacific Gyre, but zero research in the Southern hemis Hemisphere. And that's what inspired us in 2009 to start a new organization called the Five Gyres Institute and take this issue to a global level, which, which Marcus will share more about. But it's been the hard work and collaboration of many people in this room, groups like the Plastic Pollution Coalition, Surfrider Foundation, Heal the Bay, and on and on, that brought this issue to the global agenda. But with that, the industry opposition has also ramped up and gotten increasingly sophisticated. We heard some examples of that earlier from Asher. One other example right now that's happening that's particularly frightening is the industry is going state by state and introducing, sneakily introducing language that will preempt any legislation on packaging. No EPR bills, no bag bans, no straw bans, no styrofoam, none, period. So the challenges before us are enormous. 
Um, and it's now more than ever that we need smart strategic collaboration and enlightened leadership. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce one of those enlightened leaders, um, California Assembly Member Richard Bloom, without whom we would not have the federal bill today on plastic microbeads. So a round of applause for Richard Bloom. Thank you very much. It's, it's very nice to be here and uh, follow the great leadership that we have here in the room. And, and all of you are only here because you're environmental leaders. So thank you all for being here. It's uh, good also to follow, Ma follow Macklemore. Uh, that's, a, that's a first for me. Um, so I, I, I want to thank specifically, though, the um, uh, Environmental Media Association and the Nature Conservancy and, and uh, Five Tires, which I'm sure you all know is a five-pointed Greek sandwich. Um, they're very good. Uh, no, seriously, I mean, there are a lot of people out there who, probably the majority of, uh, of people in the world, and certainly here in this country, don't know about the dryers. So there's a huge um, uh, amount of education that still needs to take place. Uh, and, and most people, I think, really don't know the extent of pollution uh, in our waterways and in our ocean today. Uh, and so there's a, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And you're the folks who are going to help make that happen. And it's programs like this that help make that happen. Uh, when I uh, uh, first entered into public service back in 1999, um, my personal experience was the thing that, uh, that, that formed the actions. But then after serving on the Santa Monica City Council for 14 years, and then during that period of time having had the opportunity to chair the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission and uh, 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 serve on the Coastal Commission for several years, and since then in the State Assembly serving as the uh, chair of the Budget Subcommittee that uh, uh, basically budgets and uh, doles out every dollar that relates to environmental and transportation uh, 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 matters in the state. I've learned a lot, and I'm still on a very, very steep learning curve. But uh, I, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to be able to learn about things and exciting to be able to legislate about important issues. So uh, um, I've had some great success, and I'm very proud of that over the last three years that I've been in the state legislature and representing the city of Santa Monica, uh, Agoura Hills, Topanga, the Santa Monica Mountains, Malibu, Beverly Hills, West Hollywood, and most of, uh, of uh, Hollywood and West Los Angeles. Um, it's a great district, and it's a district filled with environmental activists and people who are really um, uh, eager to make change and bring about change. But uh, 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 we have been able to protect uh, bobcats from trapping in the state of California. Um, last year, we passed rodenticide legislation that uh, uh, banned the use of, except in very limited circumstances, uh, second generation anticoagulant rodenticides that, uh, uh, for those of you who haven't heard about this, uh, uh, small animals, rats and mice, would ingest the uh, rodenticide and then were taken by larger prey and pretty soon P22 uh, and other animals, uh, you know, that great mountain lion that we've seen photographs of, uh, uh, were becoming ill as a result of ingesting rodenticide. Well, we found out that that bill isn't, uh, isn't quite doing the job, and so we're taking a second look at rodenticide this year. But I, I want to point out also that last week, um, SeaWorld announced that it is banning the captive, <laughs> thank you, the, the, the captive breeding of, of orcas. And uh, that was, you're probably thinking I'm going to say, well, and I did that. Well, I had a small role to, to play in that, and it was very public, and people took notice. But the reality is there's millions of people, and I mean millions of people, who are engaged on this issue around the world, and they're the ones who made it happen. I just carried a little piece of legislation following the film Blackfish, which played an enormous role in raising that public awareness, and SeaWorld started losing money, and they made a smart business decision um, and a smart animal protection decision, and it's the beginning of big changes there. It's something I played a small role in I'm very proud of. Um, and then, thank you. And then there was AB 888. Um, that uh, was the ultimate uh, number that was magic for the banning of microbeads, uh, first here in California and then nationally. Uh, I thought, thank you very much. Yes. 
uh, it's very nice. Again, very much a team effort, and I should uh, uh, introduce uh, Timothy Pershing, who is here from my team, uh, who is a person who I turn to, lives up in Topanga, and is very, very knowledgeable about all environmental issues, and is one of the people who I turn to for advice. But uh, this, this bill was AB 888, but before it was AB 888, it was AB 1699. Just a bunch of numbers, but it took two years to push this legislation past, and a lot of work on, on the part of my team and the, on the part of a lot of advocates out there. Um, in retrospect, what seemed like an eternity to get the bill across the finish line was a very short period of time when you compare it to the amount of time that we've been working on the plastic bag issue. Um, that goes back, well, I remember Santa Monica passed its ordinance when I was on the city council and with you know, some assistance from me back in, I think it might have been 2005. Uh, but Santa Monica was also helping other communities push forward on that because we needed a, uh, um, an EIR done. That became a, a, a region-wide EIR. Um, there are lots of little steps along the way that make good public policy happen. And I do encourage you all to digress for a moment to get engaged um, uh, on this ballot measure. There is going to be a lot of money spent on it. The good news is they're going to spend $50 million. I hope it doesn't pass. If it does pass, all of the laws in local communities, I believe, are still going to stand. Or am I wrong about that? This only will affect the, the state law. Um, so, for example, there are numerous cities in Southern California, but only yesterday, Sacramento, um, passed a, a, a plastic bag ban. So the beat goes on on this issue. Getting back to AB 1699, originally introduced in 2014, um, we had opposition from an organization called the Personal Care Products Council. And if you look at the end of the table there, the, um, this council represents all the companies who make all that stuff that's down there. Uh, that's probably the best way I can describe them. They were um, not opposed to the bill. They liked the bill. Um, however, it turns out there was a catch. They wanted us to follow a model, and this is where you know getting digging down into the details becomes so important. They wanted us to follow a model um, uh, that uh, bill that had been passed in Illinois. Problem is, the Illinois bill, as it turns out, had an exemption for biodegradable plastic. Have you ever heard of biodegradable plastic? <laughs> well, there is some. There is some. Um, you put it into landfills, pl these plastics into landfills, and under heat, they break down. But there is no such thing as a biodegradable plastic in water. It doesn't exist. Now, I think it does exist in some chemistry labs, and I think that the, uh, uh, the, the plastics industry created this exemption because they then wanted to replace these microbeads that are in these products down on the end of the table with what they called biodegradable. But we didn't know what that was going to be. Was it going to be biodegradable? Did that mean breaking up the plastic microbeads into smaller plastic microbeads? Did it mean breaking up into chemical compounds, some of which might have been more dangerous than the original? We didn't know what it was. So um, that's why the bill took two years. Um, we put our foot down, um, they laid down the gauntlet, and we fought. The bill passed the assembly in, the first, uh, in its first uh, iteration. It got to the Senate floor. It failed by one measly vote. I'll never forget that. Um, that was, a, that was a, a tough moment. But we brought the bill back in the last session, and lo and behold, um, I think when the industry realized that we weren't going away, that we were going to push this issue as long as we had to. Um, and when my colleagues started realizing what this meant, what the, what they, they all said to me in the first iteration of the bill, biodegradable, that's great. How could you be against biodegradable? Well, it, every uh, member of the Assembly and Senate, I had to sit down and have a more detailed conversation with, than the one that we just had. That takes time. This educational process is extremely important. So, uh, lo and behold, last year in 2015, the bill came back as AB888, um, started out with the same opposition, but little by little we were able to chip away at the opposition. The Personal Care Products Council finally got fed up and realized that in fact we were right. This was a rational, logical argument and approach that we were taking. We made some proposals about how we could 
look at biodegradable products in the future and find a way to approve them through scientific analysis. Um, and if we knew that they weren't going to be uh, causing any environmental degradation, then great. You know, we weren't going to oppose them. Uh, but they didn't want that. They passed on that idea, which was, in retrospect, really kind of stupid for them. Because they could have had, they could have had that, and potentially had those uh, uh, those products in their in their products in the future. Uh, so we were left. The, the 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 council went away, but we were left with was opposition from Johnson and Johnson and Procter and Gamble, um, not inconsequential companies who have ample resources to hire lobbyists and make their case. But the tide had already begun to turn, and uh, uh, at the end of the day, the industry was unable and unsuccessful in its attempts to kill the bill. It uh, ended up passing by a very healthy margin and uh, was signed by the governor with continued opposition. Um, and, uh, and then a very interesting thing happened. The industry, recognizing that California is the eighth largest economy in the world um, and a driver of, I'd like to think, everything good in the United States, um, <laughs> when California makes a policy change, and you have a company like this, or companies like this that are manufacturing on a very large scale, they don't want to have to manufacture one way in California, another way in Illinois, and another product uh, you know, for everybody in between. And there were other states that were starting to look at our bill and come on board. So they went to Washington and they said, we want to make, uh, we want to have a common standard. Uh, and the really interesting thing that, that, that happened here was, uh, some Democrats in Congress took notes, started working with them, but said, we'll only do it if we pass the California version of the bill. Now, you didn't hear much about this um, in the news. It wasn't, it wasn't a big news item. But um, this got passed with the budget at the end of 2015. It became part of the overall budget package, and it was pushed through because the industry wanted it pushed through. And that's how through, I mean, you know the budget, the same budget that Republicans and Democrats uh, fought over, that Republicans blocked for month after month after month, that's the, that's the same vehicle that got this bill passed. Um, and it became a national standard. And, uh, and I think um, an interesting model for the kind of work that needs to be done now on a whole range of other environmental issues. I mean, you're, you've, you've heard about some of them already. You, you already know about many of these issues. Uh, the microbeads issue just scratches the surface of plastic pollution in our oceans. Uh, one of the things uh, that we started to think about this year, uh, brought to us by advocates um, like Five Gyres, uh, are uh, the, the plastic, uh, the synthetic microfibers that are uh, in the clothes that we wear and are, uh, you know, go in the washing machine, some of them come out, they go down the drain, and just like past the plastic microbeads, don't get caught up in our uh, water treatment filtration systems because they're just too small and they're ending up in great quantities out in the ocean. Um, again, another small example that exists on a large scale throughout the world. Uh, one by one, we need to identify these, find the solutions, and find uh, uh, good ways of addressing them and ending the uh, uh, this, uh, uh, epidemic of pollution that is afflicting the oceans of our world. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Well, now we heard the positive ending, the positive outcome of the microbeads issue, um, but I do want to remind you that the fight is not yet over. There still is some time, about two years, for companies to reformulate, and that means that trillions upon trillions of these beads can still wash into our lakes, rivers, and oceans unless we take action. So backing up a little bit, we're going to share a quick video on how the discovery happened, and then Marcus is going to share a bit more about the global landscape. They give us oxygen, they regulate our climate, our oceans give us food. But what's really going on is we've turned our oceans into a plastic smog.
We set out with a mission to research plastic pollution in all five oceans and then leverage those findings back to land to drive solutions. We began in the North Atlantic was our first expedition in 2010. We did the South Atlantic across the Indian Ocean, the South Pacific, Chile to Easter Island, then up to North Pacific, finding microplastics in 21% of the planet's surface. Out there in the oceans, you really can't even identify the product because it's so broken down. I mean, how do you solve the problem with this? I can't point to a company, I can't point to a country. You gotta get closer to land, into our, our rivers and lakes. So we went into the Great Lakes doing the same research, the same methods that we've used in all five oceans. There we could point to a country. If we found something, Canada and the United States share those waters. We began to find these small, perfectly round little spheres. One third millimeter in size. I had never seen that any place else in the world. We had a hunch what they were, went to your local pharmacy. We got the facial scrubs, the one that even say microbeads on the front put them through a sieve, and there they were. They matched. Polyethylene and polypropylene. It's a design microplastic that goes on your face, down the drain, out to our rivers, lakes, into the ocean. The ocean surface is not the final resting place for microplastics. It's settling to the seafloor, but it's also disappearing via the stomachs of animals that consume it. A tiny particle of plastic the size of a microbead may look like a fish egg for many different organisms. Each one of these particles of plastic is like a sponge for contaminants, things like PCBs or DDT. Many different toxic chemicals uh, can be absorbed by plastic in the ocean. It's not just, you know, one bird, one whale, and one fish, it's ecosystem-wide. They're eating all those plastics. They go up the food chain, back to you and I. Whether or not we're a fish eater, we all depend on the oceans for health. Everyone has a local lake, stream, or river, or a watershed that they care about. We can change our throwaway culture, the way we treat each other and the environment and make it much better than it was last century. You can start with these facial cleansers and toothpastes. With these micro beads, these designed microplastics, which you cannot recycle at all, that's a design that needs to be changed. That starts with us and our purchasing power. So zero waste from plastic footprint. I'm the director of research for the Five Drives Institute. If I could take a few minutes to share with you some information based on our research, uh, some things that you can use, information you can use, and I'll do a demonstration in a second of what these microbeads look like, something you can do as well. I see all of you as, as you know, our ambassadors. I mean, we know half of you anyway. <laughs> it's fun to talk to an audience where we recognize you know, old friends and make new friends. But I want to share some things with you that you can use uh, when you talk about this issue. So what I've got here is uh, very simply a, a t-shirt, some water, a bowl, and one of those products. This is Johnson Johnson's Clean and Clear. I'm going to show you how we figured out that statistic of 300,000 microbeads in, uh, in one tube.
like one, one application you might put on your face. You put a reveal. That's all plastic. <laughs> so you can imagine in one of the easy things, what we did, we took like a few grams of this cream, uh, took up the microbeads, and then spread them over some black poster paper. And over a week, we counted all the beads on the market. <laughs> Then scaled it back up to the uh, the volume twenty thousand feet. That's where we got that three hundred thousand number from. That was the royal we. <laughs> yeah, the, the royal we. <laughs> so I want to show you a couple slides. So here's the kind of work that we do out in the in in the oceans on our expeditions. And I see a few crew, crew members here. Dave Stover, I could see you. We sailed together this past summer. Uh, this is our Arctic expedition. Uh, actually heading up to the, the Arctic Circle around Iceland. And we use this net, it's like a modified pool skimmer. You drag it across the ocean surface, you reach the back of the net, and you dump the contents into a jar, and again, you count all the microplastic particles. Next slide. And a typical sample looks like this, where you've got you know, some marine life, here are some, some jellies and uh, little crabs, but abundant microplastic particles across the surface. We've done this you know, over a thousand times on about 20 expeditions, only twice have there been no plastics in our sample, and that was in the, the South Pacific near the coast of Chile. Then a week later, we were counting 400,000 particles per square kilometer in the center near uh, Easter Island. Next slide. So this is the, the map. The, the little dots are where we have sampled over the last six years, and the background image is, uh, is our modeling study uh, done by Lauren Labrit and looking at where, based on currents, where debris might flow and accumulate based on debris coming out of rivers, off of densely populated coastlines, um, coming off of ships and shipping lanes. And the assumption is you've got these, the five subtropical gyres, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, North and South Pacific, Indian Ocean, and then hot spots near coastlines. You can see the Bay of Bengal, the China Sea, South China Sea, Mediterranean, the Gulf of Mexico are hot spots as well. Well, we took all of our data and used the data to sort of put numbers to the model and came up with the, the first estimate published about 13, 14 months ago, first estimate of all plastics of all sizes in all oceans. And that magic number, a quarter million tons. And you saw from the video, that big number, about 92% of that are particles the size of a grain of rice or smaller. Now in that video, I, I think um, I said 21% of the ocean surface is covered with plastics. Next slide. It's really all of the ocean. So I had a chance uh, this time last year to go to Antarctica. We're finding microplastics there as well. Our next expedition with five gyres is to go into the Arctic um, around the west coast of Greenland, around Baffin Island, Labrador Sea, and the Northwest Passage, and look for micro and nanoparticles there as well. So this idea of a plastic smog is what should replace the idea of a garbage patch. You've all heard of the garbage patch, right? It's a bit of a misnomer. There is no real dense accumulation with boundaries. It really is everywhere. It's toxic, it's small particles, primarily, and global distribution. Much like the pollution in our air, it's the same distribution in our seas. Next slide. And you saw this, the microbeads. Once again, like you heard a few times, it's very different from our ocean samples. We could point to a country and a company, and that led to the solutions we talked about. Next slide. And then you mentioned, Stephanie, in, in New York, in the Hudson River, 500 million gallons a week yeah. of raw sewage. So, David Stover, you remember, we were, we were finding plastics in all of our trawls. We left Miami, this is last June, and sailed to the Bahamas, Bermuda, then to New York City. 38 samples, plastic in all of them. This is our last sample in the Hudson River. And it was perhaps more plastic than most of our previous samples combined. This is raw sewage. So in all that junk is a lot of plastic. And these are all poorly designed things. There's no reason why we need plastic for these cigar tips, the tampon applicators, the condoms, the bottle caps, the earbuds, the little plastic toothpicks, little drug baggies. They <laughs> are. They get flushed on the toilet, I don't know why. Poorly designed stuff. We should redesign those, I guess. And a lot of, a lot of plastic pellets over here, pre-production plastic pellets. Um, those are things that, you know, you and I consumers never see. This is poor handling of plastics by the industry. So our point is that design really matters. 
And what Anna pointed out, the Keep America Beautiful, the crying Indian ads, there's a long history of industry influencing these organizations, even creating and funding these organizations to blame you, to blame the consumer. That it's, it's your fault, you create litter. All those, remember those slogans, don't be a litter bug, give a who, don't pollute? That's all industry garbage, just to make you think it's your fault, to take their responsibility away from design. But design is where, where it's at. So I want to show you lastly just a couple of things. We've talked about microbeads. Microbeads is a kind of microplastic. Here's one of our, our North Pacific samples, the microplastics. They're these little angular fragments. And again, I don't know, you know what product, which company, which country. But almost every ocean expedition we've been on, we also find big trash from the microbeads to the macro debris. This is one, one of these net, call it net bolus. Ocean is an amazing seamstress. She can sew trash together. There, there might be, we tore one apart, found 80, 89 different kinds of net and line and rope all sewn together. When we found this net, there were three fish stuck inside of it. This net could be 20 years old, still fishing. And you mentioned you know, crab pots and fish traps that get lost, that are fishing. And I'm sure catch more fish, kill more marine life as trash than they were ever, they were ever used to, to catch fish. But I want to show you something else. And, and this, once again, is this, all this information I'd like you to use to come up and take photographs afterward and use it to share with, with others. So four months ago, I had a chance to go to the Middle East, went to Dubai and Qatar and Kuwait and Oman, a little tour of that region. And I met this man, Dr. Uli Werner. He's, he's a German scientist, lived in Dubai for 28 years. And he said, Marcus, I, I'm going to show you something. Take one day and come with me on the desert. So we drove at least 20 miles, I mean, deep into the desert, far, far from the mayhem of Dubai. And we're going over these beautiful powdery red sand dunes, amazing landscape. And there are a few little herds of camels uh, out and about. And we come over this one dune, I'm looking across, and I can see little patches of white here and there. And each one was a, a skeleton of a camel. And Dr. Werner said, let's go, let's go find one and let's see what's there. So we get to this one skeleton, and he grabs a rib, he hands me a rib from the skeleton, pulls it up, and we begin digging, using the ribs themselves. And after about maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, inside the belly, it's just bones, inside the basket of ribs that made up that camel's rib cage, was this. So this is somewhere between three and four hundred plastic bags this camel had, had eaten. And, and Dr. Werner said that, you know, with this mass in their stomach, it, it can kill them in three ways. It can block, create a blockage as it moves around their gut. It creates a false sense of satiation in their bodies where they think they're full when they're not. They can't take in more food with this mass in their body. And um, it's leaching all kinds of toxins, harboring bacteria. And so this may have killed that camel um, and as the bones deteriorate, the plastic will remain. So the point that I, I want to make is that <laughs> we've, we've reset the balance of nature by introducing this man-made material, plastic, and not taking responsibility for the, the end life of this stuff. In a globalized world where every company has potentially 7 billion customers, there needs to be responsibility for design. And what Richard Bloom has done, and, and all of my colleagues and all of you, what we can do is make sure the industry listens and force on them the, the idea that there's got to be some reduced responsibility because we can't have this in the future. Thank you. And again, Come on, come and take photographs after. I want you to, to share this. Sure. Okay. So um, I just want to highlight a couple of things. We were wanted to make sure everybody was really clear on why microbead plastics are so dangerous. And there's a couple of reasons why they should be of, of concern. The first is they're tiny, right? So by definition, they're tiny. Um, microbeads tend to be, I think they're defined as less than two millimeters. Am I right on that? Less than five, okay. Microplastics, okay. So microbeads less than two is what I was reading. But anyway, the point is that they're so tiny 
that they are getting eaten by all kinds of marine life and aquatic life in the oceans. Um, and you probably think about fish, maybe oysters, mussels, um, but I am a coral reef person. And there have been recent studies showing that tiny coral polyps are ingesting microbeads. So we're talking about the plankton feeders in the ocean, the bottom of the food chain that basically fuels the entire food web of the ocean. And so you probably know how this goes. The tiny things get eaten by those less tiny things and the bigger and the bigger and the bigger until we end up eating them. So they end up really affecting the entire food chain because they're accumulating in the tissues of each of these organisms. Now the reason, you know, in, on their own, just being plastic, um, that's a concern, right? Because I think most of us know that there are dangers associated with plastics, health dangers for us. That's why we've got all the BPA free bottles and now we're learning that maybe it's just not BPA that we need to be worried about. Um, you know, these are known as endocrine disruptors that link to cancer, um, just messing with your hormone systems. They do the same thing in other wildlife, so this isn't just something that we need to con be concerned about. It affects the reproductive capabilities of ocean organisms. But the other thing about them that's so fascinating, and you alluded to this a bit um, in the film, is that they're like these tiny sponges. They basically pick up hitchhikers all over the ocean, and not the good kind of hitchhikers, the ones you want to avoid. They attract all kinds of nasty, nasty, nasty toxins. So um, you can have one microbead that is one million times more toxic than the ocean water around it. So these are very toxic, and they're making their way into our food supply. So this is a real concern, and we are only just beginning to understand how much of an impact they or can or potentially are having on our own health, but they're certainly um, also having an impact on wildlife. So um, also something for everybody that's really important to understand is um, how they're making their way into the ocean. So I think we've heard a lot about um, personal care products. Obviously those are making their way through us flushing them down the toilet, uh, washing them down the drain. We're putting them into our wastewater. And our wastewater systems do not address these microbead plastics. So we can get rid of pathogens, we can get rid of um, nutrients, there are a lot of things we get rid of in our wastewater processes, but most of them do not address microbead plastics. So they go out with the treated water, they're discharged with the treated water and make it their way back into the environment. The other way is this other big problem of just solid waste management, which is us dumping plastic um, into the ocean or into landfills, so they end up in the ocean in many cases, and those plastics are just degrading over time, and so they end up being what we're calling microplastics. These as what you basically got in that bottle, right? So that's the other way that um, they're getting into the environment. So this really is an opportunity because we know exactly how they are getting there. We can prevent them making their way to our body, you know, to our lakes, rivers, and oceans. They don't have to get there. We don't have to even devise uh, wastewater treatment programs. I mean, we probably should, but we don't have to because we can just prevent they're dis discarding into the oceans by either not using them or finding other ways to dispose of them. All right, cool. Go ahead, you need to All right. <laughs> um, so now that we've heard about the microbeads and microplastics, um, let's, let's turn this conversation into consumer action and advocacy and what we can do on a personal level and how we can get involved. And so Asher, yeah. please take that out. Yeah, so, um, I don't know how many of you out here are uh, friends of the Environmental Media Association, Nature Conservancy, Five Gyres, but just a little quick uh, information about EMA. Uh, for over 25 years, we have been dedicated to creating advocacy and uh, action through film and television and the media. That's kind of what we were founded to do. Uh, today, the media means a different thing. And our programs, programs like this, and programs like the one I'm about to tell you about, are sort of the next logical step of that. Actually taking the idea of creating a narrative around environmental issues and linking them with true engagement pieces that we can all in the audience and in the ether of social media uh, create action from. So, uh, yes, yeah, so what we're gonna talk about now, yeah? You're gonna have to skip ahead if you hear me. Okay. How do I do that? Oh yeah, what happened to that? It's okay. Oh. <laughs> um, so we can save it for a question. Sure. Yeah. Um, so about, I'd say, 
three months ago, four months ago, uh, a guy stepped into my office, and he was a, uh, a very good-looking surfer guy, uh, just come down from Humboldt County, and he said, I have this thing I want to do, and I don't really know exactly how to do it and who to do it with, uh, but I, I think I have a story to tell, and I think that my story can make some real change. And um, his name uh, is Chad Koenig, and he's not here tonight because he's working on his sustainable farm in Humboldt County and planning uh, this incredible adventure that we're going to be doing with him over the summer. Um, what he enjoys doing, aside from being a pro surfer and owning a sustainable farm in Humboldt County, is kind of crazy. Uh, he likes to paddle on his board down long periods of time and miles down the coastline. Um, to raise awareness about various environmental missions. And a few years ago, he paddled down from, I believe, I, I, I may be wrong, and, uh, but I believe it was from Santa Barbara down to Mexico, and uh, to the top of Mexico. And, uh, and the year before that, which is what this video is, his first paddle was from San Francisco down to Santa Barbara to raise awareness about fracking. So I'm going to show you this video, and then we're going to tell you kind of what he's doing next. We can play this.
So that was uh, one of Chad's missions. Um, he wanted to up the ante. That was the first thing he said. And he said he didn't want to just show people that he could paddle long distances. And, uh, and then he told me that his next plan was to paddle uh, even longer distance. So I don't really know if he understood that the implications of going longer was definitely going to put more emphasis on it. This time next summer, which is this summer actually, Chad is going to be paddling over a thousand miles from the top of Washington State all the way down to San Francisco. He is going to be paddling to raise awareness about a variety of coastal and marine issues all the way down the coastline. And we are going to cover him in a variety of different ways. We have teamed up with the Nature Conservancy and Five Gyres conveniently. Um, we are going to... We're going to build a program essentially every time that he uh, stops for the night to rest because he can't truly paddle a thousand miles straight. Uh, he's going to go into town and do various coastal missions. We'll be pairing these coastal missions with uh, some more entertainment style stuff with uh, action sports stars, celebrities, local heroes, uh, a little bit like Anthony Bourdain's show mixed with some call to action. Uh, we are lucky enough uh, to also be a Los Angeles nonprofit group, which means that the first thing I thought of was how to package this thing. So, we got together a television network called Fusion. They're going to be covering this. Uh, we are going to be using Snapchat channels. Uh, we are going to have a daily Instagram feed, and Twitter, and we are going to gamify the whole thing with a geotagged app where you can follow Chad's journey at any time of the day. And you can, if you see Chad coming to somewhere that you might be, let's say that you are vacationing this summer in Oregon, you can tell Chad, hey, I'm a mile away, and uh, why don't you come over and I'll buy you a beer, and we can talk about something good, action-oriented, that we can do together. Um, we're hoping that this is truly the beginning of a uh, proper partnership between action sports stars and the environmental world. Uh, action sports figures, specifically surfers, skateboarders, rock climbers, uh, squirrel jumpers, which are like the people that jump off of things and open their wings and stuff. Uh, they uh, are the athletes that are most in touch with the environment. I actually learned this firsthand because two years ago, uh, I uh, went on, uh, we, we shot a campaign up in uh, the Arctic and my cinematographer, who's also a big skateboarder, uh, knew a lot more about camping than I did, um, which is actually not very hard. Um, but uh, he kind of explained to me that in the skate community, this is uh, a really big deal. And so uh, this summer, Chad, and, uh, and then next summer, who knows? Um, but we are very, very excited about this, and we feel like this is really the next step of, of true uh, consumer engagement through uh, media campaigns. Um, all right. Thank you, Asher. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna ask the panel a few questions and then we're gonna open it up for you guys, okay? So I would like to ask Dr. Stephanie, so I just read about brown water advisories in Maui last week and there's obviously a big problem there. What can we do locally to improve coastal water quality? Okay, so brown water advisory is probably exactly what you think it is. It's a pretty nasty problem and you don't want to go swimming um, when those are happening. And this is something that's occurring more and more and more. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be less and less. Um, one of the things that I think is really important for people to do at the local scale is get to know how your wastewater is being managed. Are you on a septic system? Does it need to be monitored, maintenance? Um, a lot of people just really take that for granted. Do you have a municipal water treatment system? Um, what are they removing from the water? In many cases, you have they, there's different levels, secondary, tertiary, and at each level, um, they're removing different things from that water. So in some cases, they're just removing solids. That's primary treatment. So I know I used to live in Florida, and a lot of the water was just primary treatment. They removed the solids and then just piped it out into the ocean. It's not really water you probably want to be swimming in. Um, but the residents of Florida and these coastal areas had no idea that that was happening. And so it's really not something that, there are, that everybody's announcing to you. So for example, the, what I mentioned in um, New York, most people don't know that that's happening, that, that raw sewage is discharged into the, the Hudson on a very regular basis, right? It's probably something you'd wanna know. 
So it's it's really your responsibility to get informed and find out what's happening in your community and if you or in your particular property where you live. And if it doesn't sound right to you, look into what you can do to change exactly how it's being managed in your household and in your community. So this is really one of those opportunities to get involved. And these things really don't change because government decides we should do this better. They change when communities demand it. So I think that's one of the most important things. And that is what's happening in Hawaii and in Maui specifically. The communities are getting involved in demanding that they have higher standards for how they manage their waste. Thank you so much. Um, okay, for Anna, are bioplastics a viable solution to ocean plastics? It's a great question. We get asked that a lot. There's a lot of confusion about bioplastics, and bioplastics are not all created equal. So when you think of bioplastics like the corn cups and spudware and potato forks and things like that, most of that is PLA plastic, and that is not marine degradable. A lot of it is made from GMO crops. Um, and are we just replacing one, product, one problem with another problem? Um, we often think of that as a bit of greenwashing because um, there's not the education that goes along with that that's necessary. Most people have a lot of confusion over does this go in the compost? It needs a high heat industrial composting facility and I've even heard directly from many composters that they're not really wild about it. There's another kind of bioplastic called PHA which is more promising. It is marine degradable at least after six to nine months, something like that. Um, but what I will say is, in a general sense, we definitely need more innovation, we need better designs, we need more creativity, because it's very clear that we're not able to produce all the, the products that are currently on the market out of traditional petroleum and fossil fuel-based plastics. So we need more R&D innovation, both on the design and um, alternatives for plastic, and then we also need more post-consumer solutions. Um, we have some amazing creative solutions coming up all the time. One example right here in this room is a company called Boreo. And Boreo in the house! <laughs> and they are incentivizing fishermen to retrieve uh, derelict fishing gear and then pelletizing, grinding, they could describe it more to you, but um, then repurposing those pellets and making things like skateboards and sunglasses and actually providing those pellets directly to, to, uh, to other businesses. So point being, um, not wild about all bioplastics, um, but we do need more um, design and uh, chemistry. Did you want to add something to that? Green chemistry? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, that's helpful. Um, Marcus, um, there's lots of talk about ocean cleanup. Can't, can't we just mine the oceans for valuable plastics? Is there any solution in that way? That's a good question. Yeah, everyone knows about this, this young guy, Boyan Slot, that we're talking about. Yeah. Now, now, he, I mean, 10 years ago, we were getting every month, you know, some company saying, I got an idea to clean up the ocean. And the, one of the most interesting I heard was uh, the, the astronaut from the Netherlands, he still with us in the Indian Ocean. He had m designed this spiral shaped island that was going to be pulled and spin across the Atlantic, being pulled by kites. And as it spun, it was going to collect plastic and make a bigger and bigger island. He was totally serious. He's like, I'm an astronaut, believe me. I was like, Okay, and so also from uh, Amsterdam came Boyan Slot, a young guy, 17 years old, and his idea, and he raised a lot of money. When, when I first met him a few years ago, we had dinner in Amsterdam, he had raised $2.1 million, and his idea was to make this ocean cleanup array, this big 60 kilometer, um, two giant pontoons, and then a kind of conveyor belt that would pull trash that was collected in the middle into a giant bin that could be recovered. And we began to talk, and I realized that his idea, and like, and like all the other ideas, they're not really designed for what the ocean has in mind. The ocean is very unforgiving of any moving parts. And it would just tear it apart. And other scientists and engineers tore apart his idea. But people love a silver bullet. They love to think, oh, this contraption, it's going to clean up the ocean, and we're done. Problem solved. But the reality is the plastic that's out there, it degrades so quickly into small microplastics we almost, we've never found like whole plastic bags. Almost every bottle we have found is bitten by fish on the, um, on the outer rim. So all the stuff in our coastlines becomes microplastics really fast. So if you're, if you're trying to mine in the middle of the ocean, you're going to get mostly the durable things, like the buoys and, and these ghost nets. But what's out in the ocean, it becomes also very toxic very quickly. So we have one colleague, Chelsea Rockman, who sailed with us in the South Atlantic. She wrote a paper arguing that we should call ocean plastic a hazardous substance because how toxic it is. 
So although maybe you could go get some of it and go walk on the beaches in Hawaii and pick up you know, tons and tons of trash, the reality is it's toxic stuff that, that really has no value. So the plastic industry, and if you walk on the beaches here in California, they've put on the beaches these ads that say plastics too valuable to waste. Ocean plastics are too wasteful to value. So there's really no point going on the ocean. But then people, I feel people always ask, what about what's out there? The ocean is so dynamic, it's kicking it out. I think efficient recovery along coastlines is a way to keep from washing back in. Pick that stuff up. What's out there now, we have to live with the fact that microplastics are going to settle and become this permanent layer in, uh, in the abyss, in that layer of sediment. If we, but if we can stop adding more, that's the ultimate fate. But stopping adding more is where our focus should be. Thank you. So uh, now I just want to open it up to some questions in the audience. Yeah. The mic. Is there another we mic? Have a Where's Haley? Runners. <laughs> Is there? Okay. Well, we've got we have, I think we. Well. Yeah. Sure, that, that's a very good question. So bioaccumulation, biomagnification, it, it happens with other chemicals as well as uh, um, what sticks to microplastics. So what sticks to microplastics are the same things that we actually, you found in your body. Remember we did that study, um, before we had our, our child, you had your blood analyzed and we found PCBs, DDT, PAHs, flame retardants. They're the same things we find on plastics as well. And those things, they migrate up the food chain. And as you said, little fish eat big fish, eat, eat bigger fish. Um, we're going to go to the Arctic next, um, this coming August, and I'm reading up about beluga whales and how there are uh, hermaphroditic whales based on the biomagnification of toxins at such high levels, it, it affects the, uh, the differentiation, the sexual differentiation of, of the young whales as they're developing. So the biomagnification, it's a huge issue for, for the top apex carnivores in the oceans and our bodies as well. It's not just the top predators. You see that in things like conch in the Caribbean. They're starting to see their reproductive capabilities and characteristics change just by being exposed. So it starts early. Next question. Right here. Yeah. So I guess this is for Five Gyres. You talked a little bit about uh, design and packaging. Uh, wonder how much you dug into that, and do you know about a group called Green Blue and their Sustainable Packaging Coalition? Uh, because they've done a lot of work uh, with industry um, stakeholders who are interested in designing for sustainability. So the other piece of that is what can people do, uh, in, you know, in individually and collectively. Um, I, I'm kind of a not about packaging. Uh, for instance, you can buy, uh, you know, uh, vitamins from Trader Joe's, and the bottle's this big, but the product is this big, you know, or cat food, and you got this much, this big of a bag, but this much product. So the California legislature has punted on this issue in 2013. Tim might know what I'm talking about. Okay, but uh, so I think. Uh, it's probably not something that the legislature is going to go after, but people could say, go to Trader Joe's and say, look, this is ridiculous. Why? We only want this much, you know, packaging for this much product. And any, uh, you know, sort of forward thinking, uh, um, you know, um, firm like Trader Joe's could make a, uh, you know, public relations victory out of this and say, hey, you know, we've gone sustainable, we're reducing our packaging. You still have a thousand of your, you know, vitamins, but the packaging is just as big as the vitamins are. They can make a huge marketing campaign out of that. And so just those are some thoughts thrown out there. Well, there were a couple of questions in there. One was, um, are we familiar with the Sustainable Packaging Coalition? Absolutely. Um, we first learned of them in 2007, and Marcus just had a chance to bring the camel bull list directly to the SPC and debate um, uh, a gentleman who's fighting hard to to bag the ban, right? Yeah, not ban the bag, but bag the ban. 
um, and you can talk more about that. But in terms of what, what can the everyday person do, I would say the everyday person can um, exert tremendous leadership, but in collaboration. So we're talking about both what can the everyday person do to, um, to pressure or encourage companies to follow suit, um, get involved with extended producer responsibility. And to that end, I would say um, join groups like the Plastic Pollution Coalition, Five Gyres, Heal the Bay, because we're only going to solve this problem if we work collaboratively. Um, things like pressuring Trader Joe's and even going higher up, um, pressuring some of the, the producers of packaging to adhere to a circular economy, to cradle to cradle design. And that's a dialogue that's happening right now. And then of course, on the just individual level, looking carefully at the packaging purchases and the, the consumer products that you do buy and being more mindful, but that alone is not gonna solve the issue. It's only really scalable if we, if we act in collaboration. There's a really good example of um, consumer pressure changing a behavior. Whole Foods was putting out oranges that they had peeled and then put in plastic. And when people saw this, they started posting on you know social media like crazy. And it immediately had a response from Whole Foods. They, they immediately felt, I'm sure, ridiculous. Why do we need our oranges peeled for us and then wrapped in plastic? They're already in a perfectly good wrapping. So, right, exactly. Why? I know, and I, I buy them because I know, but it's, it, it really is. That it's like, well, this is how they're coming, but, but that is um, a great way. And we do also have the power of social media to pressure when we see something that is so absurd, and we have to use that tool. It's become an incredibly powerful tool. Yeah, just to jump right in, in there for a second. I'm, I'm not hearing out because I'm just helping with this. Um, uh, another really great example of that that is not specific to uh, this particular topic, uh, EMA works very closely with Just Label It. I don't know how well aware you guys are about Just Label It, but they have a singular mission to label GMOs on products. Um, it sounds like a very, very granular thing, uh, but uh, they actually have opposition even in their own community because they only focus on labeling GMOs and they get a lot of flack from it. But guess what? In the last two months, Campbell Soup labeling GMOs and Last week, General Mills, labeling GMOs. This stuff can actually happen. It's happening right now, and it's based on Mars. That's right. That was yesterday. Um, so that, that, is, that is actual action happening based on just consumer engagement. So it, it, it is, it is, this is really the time, uh, like we were saying before, you know, the, the amount of, of social media out there today, you can pressure consumers. You don't need to only, uh, you know, put the onus on uh, amazing people like, like Richard and, and Tim over here uh, to, to do it through legislation. You can just do it by picking up your phone and, and pushing your message out. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. Piggyback on what you're saying and fortify and connect all these dots. I feel like it's all super related. For example, my friend Vipe invited me tonight. I'm so grateful. And thank you for this event. You guys are all like iconic legends in you know the world of important work that we're all doing and we care about so much. But uh, for example, I've been a you know watching and studying the microbead issue uh, since I met you guys five years ago and stopped using plastic straws when my daughter and I signed your petition. Um, and there's a company out of France that um, creates ex body exfoliants, and I just had my um, husband send me a picture of the of the uh, product at my house so I could show it to Vibe. And it's um, they replace the microbeads with fruit seeds. And um, I was thinking about how at an event like this, I do marketing and events that we could, you know, walk away empowered, Stephanie, by kind of, you know, pointing out the bad ones and then maybe also having a list of companies that we can put the marketing or spend our money you know, on their products because that speaks for itself. It does the exact same thing as just label it. The consumer engagement, where is the money going? What are, what's, you know, what's important to the consumers? And then that all falls back you know, ultimately to legislation as well. So just wanted to point that out and say there's a lot more good in the world than bad. And I know that all of these efforts are going to um, just end this, this problem and we'll move on. The next problem. Thank you so much, and I, I wanted to say something to your point. Thank you for all the changes that you've made. Um, nobody knows about this microbead issue. We are definitely part of the choir, even in California. It never ceases to amaze me how few people know about this issue. So something that everyone can do right now is share this with your friends, with your family, with your community. Guaranteed, someone has a family member who has these products in their bathroom. If not, 
you know, even us in this room. Um, we are accepting those products right now. We would love for you to look at home. Do you have polyethylene, polypropylene, anything with a poly or anything you can't pronounce you probably don't want on your body anyway? Send them to us. Um, we are continuing the microbeads campaign to really try and engage people to step up and take action. And that's a very easy thing that you can do because we have another two years of these products on the shelf. So thank you. I had a question. I just like noticed in the video that you showed, there's the most shocking thing is that PG&E is allowed to pump 300 tons of chemicals without any oversight. Mm -hmm. How is in California, which is the most liberal state in the United States, how is that possible that huge companies like that are allowed to function in a way that is so egregiously disappointing and that harms the environment and that there's no oversight at a government level, even in the most liberal state in the union? Lots of lobbying and campaign contributions make all that stuff happen. The money. I mean, and I, we talk about how, I think you were mentioning there's a few organizations saying dedicate 1% of your, your, your no. funding to no, campaign, we're saying that. <laughs> campaign finance reform. No, we have this idea we've been talking about for a while that really, no matter what your issue is, whether it's climate change or plastic pollution or raw sewage, it's really, um, our voting structure and lobbying power that is the, the ultimate barrier. But we have to keep chipping away at these battles and get people engaged, get people stepping up on social media and joining campaigns and really exerting leadership. Um, but the question was, how were they allowed to put these out in the, in the, in the first place? Yeah, how are they allowed to do that in the first place? That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not a Californian, so I don't know specifically what's happening there, but I am aware of other um, companies that get exemptions to the Clean Water Act. Um, through what you've described, powerful lobbies and, and getting engaged in that way. Um, it's always shocking when you discover that that's happening because what's the point of the Clean Water Act if people can get exemptions? So, um, yeah, I mean, this is something to get where you really want to get involved politically. Tim, do you want to say a word about that? Yeah, I, I, I would because it's, it's a lot, a lot of things. <laughs> Good. One, one of the things that uh, people tend to forget is the power of the lobbyists. And we talked about it with the plastic bags and everything, and Richard talked about it when he was talking about microbeads. The power of them not just to come after your bill and kill it when you try to do these things, but to, the knowledge is out there that you're gonna come, they're going to come after something else that you really care about. And in the propositions, it's very much that way. You may have an education proposition, a tax or something that you really, really want to get through. And you're afraid, and you know, that if you push something against a chemical company, just as a broad swath, they're going to come after that sacred cow of yours. So you don't do it that year. You don't do it that election year because you care more about that proposition than you do about this other. You trade off one for the other. So there's a lot of different things like that that you have to take into account when you're battling these things. Something very, very simple like, we have a new speaker. Whenever you get a new speaker or, or uh, Senate Pro Tem, they change the makeup of the committees. This session, there are a lot of unwritten bills floating out there. If you go and you look, you'll find bills that are called spot bills. They're in a particular code section, but they just change a couple small words. They're sitting there waiting for legislation, but you know where that legislation is going to go, what committee it's going to go into, and you know you don't want it to go to the Ag Committee, and you're waiting to see who's going to be on the Ag Committee because you'll know whether or not you can get it out of the Ag Committee. And if you can't get it out of the Ag Committee, there's no reason to bring the bill in. So it really is something to get really informed about is the actual process, the legislative process that Richard was talking about. All these bills go through it, and there's a lot of choke points for legislation, especially environmental legislation that's out there. And, and that's why you have advocates and large groups of grassroots organizations that we bring behind this because that brings a lot of power to the position that we take. And that was really the case with the microbead bill. And you saw when it happened in California, it happened across the country all of a sudden because we are so big, if we can get it done here, that's why they fight us so much. Because if it does happen here, they, they know the game is up and they go and they switch it. Same thing with the Orca bill, they, they saw the writing on the wall. So though that's the way you can get it done and that's a lot of the door stops we have in the way trying to get bills through. Thank you.
Um, oh, yeah. And then I'll get, I'll get to that side in one moment. Uh, our objective is to manage to bring more capital in the marine environmental law. Because I think that's the tool that we can develop here to give all the organization on the states the capability to fight, for example, the bombing, uh, to bring also some industry that can help clean up the ocean. Recently, I run through, we are developing financial instruments. In the United States, every year, there is $385 billion in the plan to But in that $385 billion, I think we have less than 5% or 2% that go into the ocean. So our objective is to talk to private investors invest using impact investment instrument to, to bring the capital to company like Firewire, uh, AMA, and then they can do their work. That's the best way to fight also the, the lobby. Recently, uh, Nature Call Controversy just developed a financial instrument that was helpful in many countries in the world to make a swap deal to protect the environment. I think it is a model that we should publicize the most we can and also help companies like Five Wire develop that innovative financial instrument and get the financial capital that they need to do the work as standard for AMA. That's what I want to say. Sounds like we definitely need to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, okay, I'm moving over to that side. Hold on a moment. I think we need a benevolent Frank Underwood to oh, get behind the environment. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I'm like getting a little nervous to talk, but I just figured I'd bring it up. I'm here on behalf of Lush Cosmetics, which I know helped you um, make Yay. that video. And um, I know that this woman over here brought up how you need to support um, companies that are supporting environmental causes. And part of my job, and I'm encouraged on a daily basis, is to talk about Five Gyres, um, which is a company that um, benefited from our charity pot lotion, which is a lotion that we sell on a daily basis, um, where 100% of the proceeds go to grassroots charities around the world. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Lush, it's a company that was originated in the UK. Um, we're now in over 49 countries around the world. We have cosmetics products um, that don't contain microplastic beads um, because we use all natural alternatives like sugar and salt and almonds that are going to be more beneficial for your skin and are natural. And when they go down the drain, it's okay for them to be in the environment. Um, so we have locations all around LA and all around the country. And um, I'm very grateful to be here and be paid to come here for this event. Um, just to learn more about five gyres and bring that back to my shop because um, this is a part of my daily conversation and telling people why microplastic beads are so terrible and um, just educate them about what they're using on their skin and how it affects them and how it affects our environment. Um, so yeah, check out Lush. And um, thank you, Five Gyres, for all your important work. And we really appreciate you at our store in Pasadena, which is where I'm from. And I talk about you guys on a daily basis. So just want to take that. Thank you so days. much. We learned a tremendous amount from our partnership with Lush, which uh, grew from a small partnership in 2014 to a much bigger partnership in 2015. We learned a lot about the power of working with uh, friendly companies. Um, Lush had a campaign in all 250 stores across the country to engage customers to talk about microbeads, to encourage people to take action. So really pairing up with companies that have a marketing budget and sustainable ethics um, has really been instrumental and quite a learning experience. So thank you so much. All right. Uh, cool. Hey, Mark and Anna. Um, so it seems we're a small subsample of the environmental community in California. Um, and in other words, you're sort of speaking to the choir. How do we engage, say, low-income communities and communities that don't believe that they're affected? That's a great question. There's, um, there's, there's a project that we're starting to work on right now that we're really excited about as a team, um, because as we all know, we need more diverse voices in the sustainability movement, and especially in the ocean conservation movement. Um, we've been working for the last six months on a new partnership. I think we have some of our partners here in the, in the audience with the United States Forest Service and CSU Chico to work on engaging a more diverse next generation of leaders and advocates who can really plug into campaigns. Um, so this, this is a pilot project. This is one of the ways that we're addressing 
that question that you're asking, um, but to work with a student group called Latinas in Action to give them training tools, resources, work together with them, and try and scale a program to other universities um, across uh, the Cal State University system in California. So it's, it's one small project that we're working on, but I know that many of our partners in this field are also, especially with the plastic bag ban right now, trying to engage more diverse communities, especially in California where so many people do speak Spanish and are um, Latino, um, to, to really talk not about, to talk about some of the practices and habits that are more cultural and that people don't necessarily associate with lower income communities, often saying, oh, well, they don't have time to care about these issues when actually the reverse is, is, is true. Um, so check back with us in a year and see how the project is going, but we're, we're really excited. And if, if anyone in the audience has experience or wants to know more about that, we would love to chat with you. Hi, um, I brought my three and a half year old niece here and she's been very patient. And the reason that I'm bringing that up is because I'm looking at her future. And uh, you spoke about having blood tests done and you spoke a bit about having children yourselves. And I wasn't aware of what the toxic kind of uh, fallout is from the materials that we're using. I love that you're saying that we have purchase power. And as an individual, I can affect what the design is behind the products that we're getting. Um, has this knowledge affected you personally? Are you eating differently? How do you feed your children? What, what are you doing with the information that you've gotten out there on just an individual level, other than purchasing different products for your face, for instance? I think we could probably all answer that briefly, um, but yes, absolutely, it has changed the way we live our life, the products that we buy. We have a three and a half year old little girl, um, and you know, having this blood test done on my body and seeing that in my blood serum, I have PCBs, DDT, PFCs, flame retardants, chemicals that are now passed on to her body. Um, but not to be alarmist because we, we know so little about this issue. The chemicals in my body are at tiny, tiny, tiny concentrations, parts per million, and she's perfectly healthy and wonderful and all fingers and toes and, and no problems. Um, but you know, in terms of how do we feed her, we do our best to feed her as much organic food as possible. I spend my free time growing food in the backyard. You know, we, we try our best to avoid packaging and to make sure that we're giving her healthy products, but it is, it's challenging. Um, it's definitely challenging. Did you want to add something to that? I mean, it, I think it was a, a huge uh, uh, surge in, in, in a moral impetus for me when we had our daughter to, to do this kind of work. Because you think of all the statistics out there, like there was one document that came out a month ago or two months ago, the World Economic Forum put out the plastics economy and their projections were by 2050, we'll have more plastic than fish in the oceans. And a few months prior to that, a research paper talking about the, the amount of trash would be in the oceans would, would really overwhelm our beaches. So there are these, these premonitions of what the world's gonna be like very soon if we don't do anything. And I don't think there's any precedent for what we're up against now. I mean, when I was born, there were four billion people on the planet, now we're pushing eight billion people. And everyone wants to have the same kind of convenience that we have, new emerging markets in, in India and, and Russia and Brazil, they're gonna have that convenience. I was just in, in Brussels, I came home Friday night I was invited to a conference called Polytalk, put on by Plastics Europe. And it was interesting because the World Economic Forum, their director was sitting next to me on a panel, uh, Andrew uh, Morlet. And after we had our, our panel discussion, we talked a bit. And I said, in your idea of a circular economy, you're not really pushing for policy. Policy that's going to get rid of all the products that are so poorly designed that they, they and they dominate, dominate the market share. How can you? expect a certain economy to thrive. And I realize there's some collusion between them and industry. They, they don't want to touch the idea of, of policy. And the whole conference that I was at, put on by Plastics Europe, was the same old arguments. It is the consumer behavior and waste management. Don't touch design. Let us make all the trash we want. And what really stuck in my mind was this prediction by 2050, well today they make 311 million metric tons of new plastic a year. That was a 2013 estimate of new plastic. Their prediction is by 2050, making 1.2 billion tons of new plastic a year. And it's a huge contradiction. If you don't have good policy, producer responsibility to get rid of all the bad design, 1.2 billion tons of new plastic each year by 2050, 
is going to destroy our biosphere, land and sea. So having my daughter and knowing that the best way that you got rid of your, the best cleanse was to have a child. <laughs> that's, that's, that's horrible. The, prediction, um, yeah, we, the predictions are true that we're the, we're the doom people here. So Stephanie, yeah. help us out with some more yes. good news. Okay, I'm, really, I'm not a doom person. I can leave you with tears if you well, like. I can keep going. So <laughs> it's true though, you, the mother dumps all their toxic shit on the kid. And then when she nurses the kid, she dumps more of it. So it's kind of like you're trying to do something good, but at the same time you're wondering if it's a negative. Um, no, I actually, just to answer your question, I was, so I've been a scientist for 20 years. I've worked in conservation for most of that time. And it wasn't until I had my first child that I felt like I was an environmentalist. And that may sound crazy because I was doing conservation work up until that point, because I became so aware of all of the toxic things that we expose ourselves to. The thing I got really focused on initially was cleaning products in the house and just recognizing that we're using all this toxic crap to clean our counters that we then put our food on. And from there, I just started thinking about all the other ways that I was exposing my, my family and my new baby. I had this predisposition as a child to just drink anything poisonous, and so I was worried that my child would do the same thing. So I was, my first thing was like, let's get rid of all the poisonous stuff. But then I started realizing that plastics were a problem, and so I was a complete plastic Nazi. Um, no plastic toys. My mother-in-law was not a fan of that rule and didn't really respect it. Um, and so that was a, that's been a continued source of contention over the last decade. But um, you know, no plastics and, and until Legos. My husband, my husband was a really big um, fan of Legos, and so but now Lego is looking at changing the, how they make it so that a billion investment, Legos, right? New design. It's a huge deal. They're going. They're recognizing their contribution. But you know, the thing that I came across again is like there's a moral question here. So I eliminated plastics from my household with my children, especially when they're in that sucking age, you know, eating everything. I really felt like that wasn't safe. Um, but then what do I do with it? I couldn't recycle it, so I give it away, but then there's some other poor kid that gets exposed to it. So it's really again that fact that it exists at all, you know, that it's being produced and what do we do with it? If we don't buy it, if we don't use it, where does it go? It goes somewhere, it affects somebody else. And so I think, for me, it comes back to, yes, consumers play a really big role, but we also have to work really closely with industry and work with manufacturing processes and get them to understand that there isn't a limit, limitless supply of the materials they need to use to, to make plastics. You know, we're talking about petrochemicals here. So they also have to look out into the future and look at sustainability of their businesses, and they have to start thinking about how they need to do this better, knowing that there's going to be this continued demand for better, safer products. So, but I, I do think having children just completely changes your perspective um, and how you what you expose them to. Um, we don't really have time for any more questions out here, but we will be outside uh, uh, with uh, coffee and dessert uh, to answer all of your questions. Um, yeah. So. Please excuse me. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Definitely. Yes, yes. Uh, we'll, we'll go down the, the, the panel uh, and, and I'll give you all of our information. Um, the whole point of the speaker series and the reason why we're doing it, you know, we're going to do the YouTube and the podcast and we're going to continue doing these is so that, that people get educated that might not know this stuff from before. And we're going to use social media to get all this stuff out there. On the EMA side, uh, you can tag at green4, the, the, the number 4, Emma, EMA on Instagram, uh, and you can go to uh, greenforemma.org. Uh, we have a whole section for our speaker series there. Um, Steph? Uh, we're at, sorry, we're at nature underscore dot org on pretty much every channel. There you go. And we're fivegyres.org, Facebook, Instagram, and we'd love to chat with you afterwards because that was a great question. And then uh, before we, we, we say any other closing thoughts, I just want to thank Amy Smart. Yes. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. She did a great job moderating as our first celebrity moderator, and we love her very much. Um, any uh, closing thoughts?